Brilliant. Good day, Douglas. And thank you very much for giving us some time at the Mint to talk about your work. Well, very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Brilliant. Well, maybe I could start, Douglas, by asking you about how you got into this idea of natural asset companies and how it fits into your, you know, what was the evolution uh, of the idea? Sure, sure. You know, I, to be honest, I think the evolution has been my entire life. I've always, you know, been passionate about in the environment and nature and was frustrated that, you know, we always were asking the question, you know, what's the value of nature against other potential uses? And we didn't seem to be solving it at scale through policy and others and, you know, maybe slowing down the rate of decline, but we just weren't getting to the fundamental problem that nature had been left out of the mainstream of the economy. And, and what was your role in this? Because you're talking about we, I just wonder, are you, would you say you're an economist or a, what, what's, what, what would you say, what would you describe yourself as? Yeah, you know, my entire career has been as an entrepreneur and, and, you know, if there is a focus, it's been converting an idea into a workable company project, et cetera. And so in that process, you know, I started off trying to work for conservation groups right out of college. I have a environmental management and writing degree and I, I, I couldn't get a job as kind of the teeth of a recession and you know they they were like oh we you could maybe work for six months for free and have a stipend and i said oh my gosh i need something better than that and uh, went on and you know i started a company right out of college and my father was instrumental in saying you know i think you really need to understand how business works because you know you're often looking at industry and business as a driver of bad things and if you could understand how finance and business could be harnessed, I think you'd find it more effective than policy. And that stuck in the back of my head. And, you know, I eventually had the resources, you know, to work on projects like this. Brilliant. And and so this actual initiative, Natural Asset Company, where, where did that, when did that start? And you know, I, I had done a very large conservation property with my wife upstate New York, and it was both very satisfying, but also realized the limitation of you know, conserving, this was about 7,000 acres. And yet that was a drop in the bucket. And even if I was a Ted Turner, that's a drop in the bucket against the need of the world, right? Yeah. And so we started to work on film um, and television started off in documentaries. And I wanted to do a documentary about natural capital to get people to understand what nature, you know, was providing, what services and why that was important. And probably around 2015, 2016, as I was working on how to explain it, I realized that maybe I should try to solve the problem rather than just talk about the problem. So through many hikes up in the Sierra, I was in California at the time, you know, came to the notion of we fundamentally need to address externalities and create a new asset class based on nature so that we could use the capital system to generate resources in line with our, you know, environmental and social values and fix that, you know, fundamental flaw that we'd left nature largely out of the economic system. And I suppose some people might say, you know, well, the problem has been finance in terms of funding destructive activities, and they're fundamentally driven, obviously, by accumulation of profits and, and so on. How can you trust them when it comes to investing and, and regenerating nature? Yeah, I, I don't think it's a matter of trust. It's a matter of aligning interests. So, you know, what we've done in our system so far is we said we've given every incentive to do extractive, to do destructive things at scale because it efficiently produced goods and services but it left off the table the costs of producing those goods and services. And probably as important or more important, you couldn't directly profit from the goods and services nature produces. And to give you an idea of the magnitude of that, it's been estimated that you know nature's goods and services, call it natural GDP, is $125 trillion. The asset that produces that is many multiples more than that. And if we look at 
the attempt to exclude that, the way we tried to solve it was to use taxes or regulation, now artificial or transfer markets to bring pricing back in. And we're underfunding biodiversity by maybe six to $800 billion a year, according to the, Paul, uh, the Paulson Institute, climate change, maybe three to $5 trillion a year underfunding. And if we're truly going to move to a sustainable, you know, future circular economy, it's orders of magnitude more. So we need two things. We need price signaling, and we also need capital formed based on the underlying asset itself. So investors could make that choice, which we talk to all the time. They're saying, we'd love a pure play to invest in nature, to truly solve, you know, climate issues. So I wouldn't want to try to trust people if their interests aren't aligned. You know, if there is more value from taking a tree from the forest and turning it into lumber than that forest producing ecosystem services, then we're always going to fight an uphill battle. So I, I, I think we need to change fundamentally our economic system to value nature and include it and include those social and environmental values that most people truly hold, but they don't know how to exercise it on a day-to-day -day basis. I suppose, I mean, if I remember back to my accountancy and, and you know, how you value assets, and it's the net present value of future revenues that you control, you, you, yep. you, you can reasonably be sure of getting hold of, if you like. So, and that's real, obviously that's real cash. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you take a natural asset in that sense and say, well, what are the, what's the stream of future revenues from that asset? I mean, what, when you're explaining this to potential investors, how do you, how do you describe what the future revenues are? Yeah. So, you know, the, the paradigm that we set up that you've just described, current and future cash flows, right? That's the way you value an equity. There are assets like gold or paintings or others that just appreciate because people buy them. And, you know, we sometimes say greater fool's theory. It's a higher price. They're kind of binomial. But equities have been priced on current and future cash flow. And that worked successfully for several hundred years. But the problem is we never had divvied up who owns, you know, natural assets. And could you charge for oxygen production and genetic potential and climate stability services. So all that's externalized from the economy, right? So what we said was we need to include that in a financial instrument that does two things. One, it moves the asset from unpriced to priced. You could do that in a binomial, but these assets are fundamentally different. They produce goods and services of known value. That's what ecosystem service values are generated off of. So you know, it's a 20 year, you know, discipline of measuring in financial terms, each of those ecosystem services. And so what we said in our model is we need a new paradigm. We need a new way of looking at this as a financial instrument that includes, if there are, you know, monetized values under GAAP or IFRS, great. But we want to arm investors with another set of financial information. And that is our statements of ecological performance. And that says, what are the flows of ecosystem services? Whether they're monetized today, might be in the future or not. What's that asset value worth itself that produces those goods and services that makes life on earth possible? And half of our global GDP is dependent or highly dependent on that. And if we so, look at it from that perspective, we should be looking at price to ecosystem services as a measure and a driver of this. It's a much more fundamental way to look at the value of nature without having to agree on price and ownership across the world like we have very incrementally and not completely with carbon, for instance. But I suppose one one thing you said earlier was that it, it was you, you couldn't really trust investors, but you had to align interests. And <clears throat> I suppose what is the investor interest in what might be seen as these theoretical values, which don't represent actually real money flow, flows. Well, I, I'd argue that they're the most fundamental of values, because if we don't have a functioning ecosystem, we don't have a functioning economy, we may not even survive on the planet. And so what we've said is, and I, I think most people agree with this statement, that finance is an agreement to agree between a willing buyer and seller, right? And we've seen that 
you know, proven with new asset classes, all the digital NFTs and uh, all, all the different coin offerings, whatever the precept is between a willing and buyer and seller becomes true. And what we've said is we can measure these values. We can measure the assets. So, you know, I'll, I'll give you a good example of the, the type of valuations that would take place. Costa Rica recently did a study of their ecosystem services on from all their protected areas. And the annual production of ecosystem services were about $14 billion a year. That imputed to an asset value because these are long lived assets and they go yeah. to years discount and back. And that's a asset value of 845 billion. Okay. Now the problem is exactly what you said. No one's charging rents for that. And we said, you know, think of this like a company that doesn't pay a dividend. What are you actually buying in Berkshire Hathaway? You're buying a share, right? You're hoping the price goes up related to the production of the underlying investments that Berkshire Hathaway has made. You're not getting a dividend. You're not looking for a cash flow. And Bob Hers, the former chair of FASB, gave me a statistic that kind of tells you the way our markets have been moving in the equities. When FASB was formed, price to a book was about 80% of the listed value of companies on average. Today, it's 12%. It's expected to fall under that. So the majority of values we're looking at are not captured in current financials. Nature needs to be included in a different way. So it's a bit of a paradigm shift for people, right? To say, hey, my value is going to be the appreciation of the stock based on how much ecosystem service it produces. What's the value of the underlying asset that appreciates over time because nature does that as opposed to depreciating. So we put together this framework to say, investors, if you believe that nature has value and you know many have raised their hands and said, yes, we do. And if you can buy off on this idea that th your investment will appreciate because of increased production of ecosystem service, moving from degraded to you know, more productive land, protecting areas, making sure they're protected for the long run. All of these different management structures, along with the inherent value that nature does appreciate, is a driver of the equity based on the underlying productivity of the asset, just like we do in equities today. But we have to make that shift because otherwise we're going to have to wait for governments around the world to agree to price on every single ecosystem service in the correct way and, and, and that causes a tax, essentially, on the, the current generators of wealth. And they don't like it, right? So <clears throat> if you have regulation or taxes, there's just so much you can take from that. We want a direct investment in nature to produce wealth within a natural market, but allow people to value an intact forest, an intact coral reef, whatever that people value. And we'll find out through price discovery just what that value is. So if I understand this right, you're saying that <clears throat> over the, the last whatever period, 10, 20 years, that <clears throat> the traditional relationship between investment and revenue flows and payment of dividends and, uh, has disappeared. And people, are, I suppose, classically investing in companies that get bigger and bigger, you know, the values get bigger and bigger over, but they don't pay dividends and therefore you get capital gains from yeah. it. And in a similar sort of way, there's an expectation, I suppose, that ecosystem services will become more and more important going forward, presumably because they'll be more rare, you know, they're, 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 they'll become valued more as we see the, the, a lot of the world becoming more degraded. Then by investing in them, other people want to invest in them. The, 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 you'll, you will get sort of asset inflation effectively in, in a way. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say necessarily inflation. I mean, there is a scarcity theory. I don't think that works as well for nature. You know, that. It, it, if you were valuing nature on scarcity, you'd say that, you know, one elephant was more valuable than a healthy herd of 70. And we know that's not true. Or a single acre of rainforest is more valuable than a functioning, you know, larger ecosystem. We need to flip that a little bit and say, this asset is productive. We can measure it in financial terms and apply that to a framework that investors are used to. And so as we've gone out to investors from, you know, be it family offices, uh, DFIs, sovereign wealth funds, funds that are dedicated, you know, for ESG or sustainability. And very interestingly, those that have no mandate in that direction, 
they're saying we're looking for an investment directly in the things that will drive climate change, you know, to a solution to protect biodiversity, to change agriculture from extractive to regenerative. And, you know, we present this exact framework and they say, we understand the logic. Is everyone going to jump in and do that day one? Probably not. Not everyone jumped into digital assets in the beginning, right? And that's a much less, you know, tangible value. That's a, you know, a, a, a an algorithm in a computer as opposed to that which makes life on earth possible and enjoyable. I, I think we have a better value equation. But I suppose, you know, digital economics is has been around the ability to you know, make money through advertising and through selling information about consumers, you know, all that sort of stuff. I mean, do you think people are also your investors are going to say, well, let's see what revenues, real revenues we can get. I mean, if you could get revenues. Um... Sure. There's optionality within this. So when, when I said, you know, when I was talking about digital assets, I wasn't talking about, you know, Google and advertising. Oh, right. I was talking about buying a Bitcoin or an Ethereum and, you know, we're looking at that market is now what over $3 trillion of asset value based on computer algorithms and scarcity of mining. Right. So it, it's, it, it, it's a much less tangible asset and, and less vital. So what we're looking at here is we know how to measure nature's value. And I think, the optionality that we can look at is one day, just like the carbon market, we'll price in all 38 major ecosystem services, right? That's one future. And the other is that won't come about and people will be comfortable with the flexibility of financial instruments to capture that value through an equity structure in a natural asset company, because we just don't have time for the world to agree. You know, I don't think we're getting there with climate. We're certainly not getting there with biodiversity. And if we're going to get to a resilient, fairer, less bubble prone economy, we're really going to have to in, employ the capital markets. Kind of the thing that got us in trouble is the only engine strong enough to get us out of trouble, that, the way we see it. Uh, and I suppose, so money will be invested and this money will be used to restore ecologies, to protect them and so on. So it, exactly. and that is an ongoing, there will have to be an ongoing flow of money in, if you like, won't there? Yeah. So if, if you think about as, you know, you raise money around a protected area for a government, right? So governments that have, you know, been good stewards, they have primary forest or good, you know, coral reefs, they're not being rewarded for that today. So we're providing the ability of that asset to be turned into financial capital. So it's actually, we've talked natural capital, but it's actually natural assets. We wish it was financial capital and natural capital. In that process, there's money. That can be invested in, you know, let's say an endowment. So that park or that protected area, that bio corridor is forever, you know, managed. So that's one aspect of it. If there's more money based on green wealth and there's significant green wealth out there, it could be invested more traditionally in sustainable development. So regenerative agriculture, things that would give a return. And then we can look at a future that's kind of bifurcated where eventually we've priced in the value of nature. We started to address externalities by looking at the true cost of and the relative values of land use. You know, right now you can't really look at a forest for its production of ecosystem service. You can only look at it for, can I cut it down and develop it? Can I make timber? Can I get mineral extraction from it? You know, and, and that makes a false economy because it's missing major elements. And that's why we have the, the problems that we do. I suppose if, if there is a drive to obviously gain revenue, there's a question of, you know, if you control something, um, there is the potential obviously to get people to pay for things that they previously actually haven't paid for. I mean, take the, the value of oxygen, obviously people get it for free at the moment, except if you live in a city where it's really, really polluted and you have to pay money to get oxygen chance to be able to, to breathe. On the face of it, that doesn't seem like a, a good outcome, does it? I mean, I mean, <clears throat> I'm presuming if you, at the moment you're focusing on Costa Rica, is that right? Um, That's one, we're, we're working in a number of countries. So. Are mainly developing countries? No, we have projects here in the U.S. looking at projects in Europe, and certainly the Global South is a priority because a lot of biodiversity is stored there, right? And it's still intact. And so we, we kind of need to preserve what we have and make sure that, you know, the, the stewards of it, the local populations, the communities benefit 
from conservation. You know, so we've written into the rules of a natural asset company that you must share the benefits with the local community. I think one of the, you know, the drawbacks in the minds of a lot of, you know, folks of conservation is it locks that asset away. We can no longer use it. We need to align the interest and livelihoods with functioning ecosystems as opposed to just extractive alternatives. We're working with a, a, a native corporation. Um, they're the stewards of 1.7 million acres in the United States. And they're looking for an alternative to extractives, right? There could be timber, there could be gold, there could be, you know, other mineral minerals. And they go, that's not really in keeping with what, you know, our culture is and our heritage. If we could get value for the land and the services it's providing to the world through this financial instrument, we're in. I mean, that's what we're doing with carbon right now. We're just trying to make it a natural market that doesn't require sovereigns to come in and price set so that we can work more naturally, create new capital based on nature, as opposed to just transferring it from one agent in the economy to the other, which has its limitations. I just wonder, I mean, going back to your point at the beginning, that you're looking to align interests, and I suppose I, <clears throat> I find it difficult to see that your investors won't require some sort of philanthropic perspective, because presumably to do various things like provide benefits locally, to work collaboratively, to, you know, to avoid negativity, et cetera, requires some level of caring, I guess, that is not normally associated with a standard yeah. uh, you know, investor. So what, what we're looking at, and this is what I mean by aligning of interest, if the measurement of the company's performance is that that asset produces or is restored and it creates more you know, economic opportunity, then we've aligned the interest not to the extractive side or the traditional development and traditional cash flow mentality. We're saying nature has value. It's producing goods and services that are consumed around the world. We know that. So it's in the interest. So you, you think about a company being formed and if the stakeholders are the local population, whether it be from a government or direct ownership, either on public or private lands, and we say the equity can be owned by this group, then when we produce more ecosystem services, the investors see their value of their shares go up. The local community says, I've created wealth based on that forest, that grassland, that marine environment being natural and productive. I now see my interests on the local level aligned with a healthy ecosystem be that agricultural lands or natural lands. And the investors are also aligning their interest because their return, that appreciation of their capital stock is based on how nature is performing, how healthy it is, as opposed to what I'm pulling from it. So <clears throat> I wonder if this sounds to me a bit, almost like more like an art market or something like that, where, you know, that somehow Nate, in a way nature becomes. Sure beauty or, 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 you know, that the people say, I want to invest in something that is beautiful. Do your investors, would your investors, I suppose, value, you know, that sort of relationship and knowing exactly what it looks like and, you know, all that sort of thing and maybe put something on their wall or, I mean, you know, how would they uh, um, yeah. get that? I think you're looking at, you know, like NFTs or digital assets that are similar. Um, it differs from the art market in the sense that art, yes, moves from unpriced to priced when you sell it in a, in, in a transaction. But this is a productive asset that produces goods and services. So taking your analogy, if your painting produced food, fresh water, if it, if it produced genetic potential, flood risk reduction, climate stability, all of those things, then I would say, yes, that's a good analogy. Nature is much more than just a you know, an asset that's non-productive. That's why it can benefit from active management. And it's a different asset than those binaries, you know, gold paintings, you know, residential real estate that you own that you're not renting out. There's a use value, but you're waiting for the appreciation, you know, and if we look at all investments, what drives an investor is they think that investment will appreciate, right? They'll make money. And if we can show how this is driven forward and there are real metrics that, you know, are based on real science and real economic value, 
then I think we have a very good way to align the interest and produce for investors what they're looking for, a return on investment, and, and, and get around some of the problems that we've had where philanthropy is not enough, right? We, we can't fill the hole with philanthropy and just good intentions. So, I, I mean, I suppose it comes down to the fact, I suppose the, the value of thing is what people perceive it to be valued uh, you know it, it is about perceptions isn't it i was thinking actually i mean art people would argue it feeds the soul you know and we do have you know it's central to culture our identity and all sorts of things isn't it and and i suppose nature as well people a lot of people approach their relationship with nature from an aesthetic viewpoint as well don't they that is, you know, I would say spiritual, cultural, and aesthetic. And if you look when you do an ecosystem service valuation, those are values that are included. And, and I mean, we can say that if you're in a, you own property that overlooks a natural area, your values are higher. You know, if you're in New York City, apartments that have a view of Central Park have a higher value, right? Why? Because we appreciate those things. So if we start to accumulate those values, and in you know, a systematic way, report how they're growing or shrinking, depending on how management goes forward. We're doing that. And you said something very important, and it's very true, because I think sometimes we get locked into finance as if it were biology, chemistry, or physics. It's natural law. It's a social invention. It is something that we, between willing buyers and sellers, and by social agreement, the underlying becomes true. And so if there is a subset of the world, and I think this is a growing subset that believes nature is valuable and we have to fix these problems and they can invest directly in it and they see that price appreciation, then we open the door to that future where we've now incorporated the value of nature through the ingenuity of a financial instrument, which people have been innovating for a long, long time. And this is just a natural kind of evolutionary step of trying to include nature's value. This, in this case, through natural market function. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Douglas. That is fascinating. I had not really expected that sort of take on things and I, I will certainly reflect on it and it'll be fascinating to see how your project uh, proceeds. Great. Well, I appreciate having the, 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 the time to speak with you and enjoy the questions. Thank you.